Good morning, my name is Hugh Elin. We're here at Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. Um, and I'm really thrilled to have Dr. Jamil Abelhosen today, who is the Streisand Chair of Cardiology and the Director of the Adult Congenital Heart Program at UCLA. And Dr. Abelhosen today gave us a fantastic grand rounds talking about transcatheter inventions in adult congenital heart disease. And so I wanted to follow up a little bit with him today and ask him what his thoughts are about the future. So, Jamil, when you think about um, what's happened in adult congenital heart disease and, and transcatheter interventions, what do you think are sort of the places where we really need to innovate over the next, say, five years? And then projecting a little bit further, maybe in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years, what are the really important points that we need to make progress at this point? Um, so first of all, thank you for having me here. And uh, it's been a very enjoyable day. Um, and th that's a, you know, that's a big question. Um, let's start with the five years. Um, I think in the next five years, uh, there are a few areas that we can focus on um, that'll push the field forward quite a bit. Uh, one of the areas is what we spoke about uh, in uh, the Grand Rounds uh, talk, which is the use of self-expanding um, stent or valve platforms uh, in order to address native right ventricular outflow tract lesions, patients with severe pulmonary regurgitation, mostly those with the trilogy of Fallot, uh, which are close to 80% uh, of all patients with RVOT problems mm -hmm. uh, in ACHD. So that is an area of, at this point, unmet need, uh, and there are a number of valve platforms and RVOT reducer platforms in clinical trials my hope is that within the five years, those clinical trials will be completed and we will have FDA approval for uh, the use of these, uh, of these devices. Um, and that, I think, is the short-term goal when it comes to some of the interventional work that we're doing. Um, I think there are other areas that we need to focus on with longer-term goals. Um, one is uh, the treatment of patients with single ventricle physiology. Uh, Fontan patients. Mm -hmm. What's the problem there? Well, the problem is you have one ventricle, um, you know, maybe a second hypoplastic ventricle or true single ventricle, but the reality of it is the essential problem with those patients is that they do not have a pump to the lungs. And right now with the currently available ventricular assist device technology, um, you know, everything that we have has external power sources, has not truly been tested in the single ventricle circulation, in the Fontan uh, circulation, specifically as a right heart support kind of pump over any duration of time. Um, the animal studies and some of the human case reports show promise. Mm -hmm. um, but what we need to do in that sphere is we need to miniaturize the ventricular assist devices and we need to have a, uh, an internal power source. Mm -hmm. um, so that people don't have wires sticking out of their chest um, and wearing battery packs all the time. I mean, it's just not a sustainable way to do things if we're going to apply this to a younger population that are going to live with these kinds of support uh, um, uh, devices. So I think miniaturized assist devices, internal power source applied to the Fontan population um, is, um, has to come at some point. Um, I would see the Fontan then as a palliation, maybe a 10, 15, 20 year palliation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a child gets a Fontan uh, and maybe when they're 12, 13, 14 years of age, nearly adult sized, um, then they can get an assist device at that point before they manifest all of the long-term multi-organ consequences of having a Fontan. What are the multi-organ consequences of having a Fontan? After 20 years, liver failure, protein losing enteropathy, renal dysfunction, etc. So that's an area I feel quite passionate about and I, I truly feel that um, in the interventional space, um, this is something that we should be able to do. Um, other things that I think we need to address, the tricuspid valve for us is a major problem. Um, you know, when people think of adult congenital heart disease, they think of inherent tricuspid valve problems like mm -hmm. Epstein's anomaly. And yes, that is part of the problem, but a bigger problem for us uh, is functional tricuspid regurgitation mm -hmm. 
due to a myriad of reasons, but say chronic volume overload of the right ventricle or due to pulmonary hypertension. Um, and we have trouble treating that. Um, we can try to apply some of the clip technologies like the mitra clip to the tricuspid position and there's variable success there. Um, but in reality, if you have an annulus this big and tricuspid valve leaflets that are barely touching or not touching at all, to just try to pin the leaflets together seems to me uh, to not be a great solution. I think you need an annuloplasty as well. Mm -hmm. So figuring out how to do transcatheter annuloplasties mm -hmm. um, is going to be really key. And again, there is early research into this. Some clinical trials taking place, one into the trial line device, mm -hmm. for example, and we'll see what comes of that. But I think that's going to be really important. Non-surgical means of treating progressive tricuspid regurgitation. Um, if you think about the outcomes of severe tricuspid regurgitation in our patients, they're actually pretty horrendous. Mm -hmm. And it really increases the long-term risk of multi-organ failure in these patients. And the surgical risk of tricuspid valve repair or replacement is quite high. So tricuspid valve repair, transcatheter, another long-term goal. And I think the third long-term goal in my mind is um, finding means of um, developing stents that are going to be bioabsorbable, that are not, you know, going to continue to be a non-compliant scaffold. Um, stenting um, coarctations of the aorta. Uh, we do it all the time and we pat ourselves on the back after we do it because we think we've resolved the gradient under anesthesia while the patient's asleep, and we have. But invariably, when that patient wakes up and you check a Doppler echo, mm -hmm. especially if you have them exercise, you're going to get a high gradient um, through the area that you stented. There's nothing wrong with your stent. It's just a stiff metallic tube in a vessel that is supposed to be compliant and have um, a certain amount of deformation in systole and diastole. Um, and so absorbable stent platforms will hopefully allow for that allow us to scaffold early on, open up the aorta, and then over time get absorbed into the wall of the aorta and allow the aorta to be pulsatile throughout. Um, that has um, not come to fruition yet. And there's been a lot of work over the last 10 years uh, in the area of absorbable stents. We saw what happened in the coronary realm mm -hmm. with that. Um, so sometimes the promise of a technology um, is not the same as reality, uh, but it doesn't mean that the you know, baby needs to be thrown out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a place for this technology, uh, and I think specifically in ACHD patients with pulmonary artery stenosis, with coarctations of the aorta, with venous uh, baffle stenosis, these kinds of absorbable stent platforms are going to be absolutely key. Um, so I think those three major areas for me are areas where we need incremental growth, we need some serious research to be done. Um, and if I had to rank out of those three, which one I feel is the number one priority um, in my mind, it's um, finding ways to help the failing Fontan. Um, because that population has terrible long-term outcomes. Um, you know, our Fontan patients, by the time they're hitting 40, 45 years of yeah. age, um, many of them are just falling off a cliff. Mm -hmm. And um, we're now doing a lot more, not just heart transplants, but heart and liver transplants, heart-lung transplants. We're even considering a patient now at my institution for heart, liver, kidney transplant in a mm -hmm. Fontan patient. Um, you know, this is not, um, I don't think, a sustainable way to treat this population. So I would put that as my number one. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your really fantastic insights, both this morning as well as just now. Um, we hope that we'll have Dr. Jimmy Labohosen back here in the future again to teach for us here at the Houston Methodist Debicki Heart and Vascular Institute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.